2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. And the King James text today reads in this fashion. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic the hard truth. Amen. The hard truth. Praise the name of the Lord. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, today, God, once again, Lord, we humble ourselves in your divine presence, recognizing, oh God, the inadequacy, the weakness, the frailty of our humanity. Lord, Certainly today there is not a thing in the world I can do or say that would bring benefit or blessing to the hearing and the life of a child of God except that the Holy Ghost anoint my lips of clay and help me to deliver the word which I believe God you have laid in my spirit and instructed me to bring to your people at this hour. This will not always be an easy word to hear, but Lord, it's a necessary word. Help us today, O oh God, to eat our spinach. Help us today to eat our broccoli. Lord, to consume that which we may not enjoy, which we may not altogether find pleasant, but that which is necessary to our nutrition and our well-being. We ask it all in none other than the name of Jesus, above which there is no other name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Christianity today has become a religion of comfort and convenience, especially here in America. Believers have falsely been made to believe that as we're walking with the Lord, we're supposed to walk with comfort and blessing and abundance and prosperity. And all will be 
well with our soul. Nothing will ever go wrong. We will experience nothing but health and good things. And every good thing will come our way. But my friend, I've got some hard truth for you today. And thus the title of my message, The Hard Truth. This is not the message of the cross. This is not the message of our Christ. This is not the message of the Bible. Amen. In the Word of God, when the Apostle Paul was converted... When he met with the Lord face to face on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9 verses 10 through 16. We read of uh, Ananias being called upon by the Holy Ghost to go and minister to this newly converted man Saul. And the word of God reads, And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel. Now listen to verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Wow. God is sending a messenger to the newly converted soul. So that if it were the modern American church. So he can tell them how wonderful living for God is going to be. And how much blessing there is. And how God will keep you from all sickness and disease and trouble. And all will be well now that you're a child of God. Nothing will ever go wrong again. Wrong. That is not at all what Ananias was sent by God to Saul to share. He said, I want you to help him understand all the things that he must suffer. My Lord, have mercy. I'm going to tell you, if you explain to most people today shortly after conversion, the realities, the hard truth of living for God. Do you hear me now? If you share with them the hard truth of Christianity, it is a discipline. It is a way of life. There are things you're going to do. There are things you're not going to do. I have a number of groups on Facebook that I moderate and I've created over the years. One of them is for LGBT Christian people. And one man recently posted a comment that I found very disturbing. He said, I don't go to the Bible for instruction on how to conduct myself sexually. And I thought to myself, really? Isn't that interesting? You know, we used to sing a chorus years ago in the church. And in that chorus it said, Lord, if you're not Lord of everything, then you're not Lord at all. You don't keep certain rooms of your house closed off to King Jesus 
and claim to be a follower of Christ. You don't keep certain areas of your life to yourself and not allow the Lord into those areas. Come on now. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to upset a lot of people today, but I'm just telling you the hard truth. The Word of God talks about some of the most practical things in the world right down to how a child of God ought to dress. Oh, preacher, you're letting the old-time Pentecostal holiness come out in you. No, I'm letting the Word of God come out in me. The Word of God teaches that as children of God, our fashion is not determined by the world. It is not determined by the social attitudes of the society in which we live. No, we are not to be sexually motivated in our dress. We're supposed to dress, according to Scripture, modestly. Now, I'm not going to stand here like a lot of churches and try to dictate to you uh, exactly what defines modesty. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that if you're wearing shorts, then that's immodest. No, there are shorts that are perfectly modest and there are shorts that are perfectly immodest. If you're wearing shorts and the leg of that short doesn't come down any further than the crack of your crotch, then they're too short. If you're wearing clothes that are so tight that there is not one curve or one stray hair on your body that cannot be seen, if people can count the pimples, oh my Lord, on your body through your garment, then honey, I got news for you, it's too tight. Oh, but you know, in our world today, we celebrate our sexuality. You know, women are supposed to dress so that we appear sexy and appealing. You know, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about for the secular world. That's not what it's all about for the child of God. For the child of God, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You ought to show it some reverence. You ought to show it some respect. You shouldn't be out there advertising your body like a piece of meat in a butcher's window. Oh my goodness, oh the preacher, he getting old time Pentecostal today. No, I'm not, folks. I told you, I'm speaking the hard truth. That's what the Word of God says. There is not an aspect of our living that Christianity and the disciplines of Christianity do not touch upon and do not affect every aspect of our life. The Word of God has some counsel, some advice, and in some instances some commandments, as it were, related to that aspect of our life. Sexually, you're to conduct yourself responsibly. Mm -hmm. You're not to be out there floating around, letting lust rule and reign in your body. You're not supposed to be using other people to pleasure yourself. And then abandoning them and having nothing more to do with them because after all, you got what you were looking for. Honey, that's how they do in the world. That is not how they do in the church. Mm -hmm. That is not how a Christian behaves. That is not how a Christian acts. I know preachers, and, and I'm ashamed to speak the words that I'm about to speak. I know preachers in the LGBT community who call themselves one God, Jesus' name, apostolic preachers, who engage in sexual exploits with their partners involving others, third parties, and beyond. And when someone asks them about their conduct and doing things in this way, their response simply was, oh well, boys will be boys. Wrong. A child of God does not live by the same rules as a child of the devil. A child of God, a believer in Jesus Christ, does not live by the same rule as an unbeliever. 
We honor God in our living. We honor God. We seek to be a testimony and a witness in the way that we conduct ourselves and in the way that we behave and in the way that we do things. And if we're not honoring God, then we are not honoring our commitment to God and we are not demonstrating that we have a relationship with God. Beyond some of the most practical, simple aspects of life, there are much more complicated aspects of life. There are much more uh, involved areas. There are things in this world with which we must struggle. There are things in this world with which we must reckon like sickness, disease, uh, uh, Sometimes we're, we have to deal with addiction. Sometimes we have to deal uh, with troubles that come our way, temptations and trials. I'm here to tell you today, the good news is the greatest testimonies are born of the greatest struggle. The greatest glory is to be imparted to those who have suffered the greatest sorrow. The Apostle Paul said in verse 11 of our primary text today, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Hallelujah. You see, people want everything to be sweetness and pie. People want life to be without trials and troubles. Christians want to be able to go through this world without ever experiencing hardness or hardship. I've got news for you today, and it is the hard truth. That is not how this faith works works. The good thing about living for God is when we go through our troubles and our trials and our difficulties, when we struggle with sickness and disease, none of this is done on our own. Hallelujah. Because our God is with us every step of the journey. But that doesn't mean we won't have to journey there. Everybody wants more than the next guy has. But nobody wants to do more. Nobody wants to give more. No one wants to suffer more. Nobody wants to experience more than the person in front or the person behind them. I'm going to tell you, I've heard preachers ask the Lord why they must suffer and experience trouble. Listen now. This is their logic, their reasoning. When they are, quote, only doing the master's business, end quote. In other words, I'm working for the Lord. I'm doing God's business. I'm, I'm doing what uh, God called me to do, bless God. Shouldn't everything be perfect because I'm doing that? Shouldn't I be free of any struggle because I'm working for God? Shouldn't I never have to go through sickness or trials or temptations or troubles? Because after all, I'm working for the Lord. That should exempt me from a... What idiotic thinking. There probably was no greater servant of God that ever walked the face of planet Earth than the man Saul who became the Apostle Paul. And yet Paul, Saul I should say, was told by Ananias from day one the hard truth. What things he must suffer for the name of the Lord. I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to tell you the hard truth. Living for God ain't going to be easy. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's some highs and there are some lows. Mm. There are some struggles and there are some glories. Mm. There are some wonderful times and there are some less than wonderful times. God has a way of making 
the good times so far outshine the bad times that when you're in them, you forget all about the bad times. Hallelujah. And the wonderful thing is, everything cycles. You know, there's an old saying, what goes around comes around. Uh, history repeats itself without fail. When you're going through the bad time, just remember, there's another mountain coming. Hallelujah. When you're walking through the valley, remember, it wouldn't be a valley if there weren't a mountain on either side of it. Hallelujah. Don't worry. There's another high spot coming. And you will get there. And you will once again rejoice in victory. You will once again rejoice in blessing. You will once again rejoice in prosperity. You will once again rejoice in the goodness of God. It's coming and always comes back around. And I've got news for you even in the low times. God's there with you. You're not going through it alone. You know the word of God talks about the fact that God causes His Son, it says, His Son, to shine upon the just and upon the unjust. He causes it to rain upon the just and the unjust. And you know, it's funny, we read that passage of Scripture, and I think most of the time, we really do not appreciate the full value of, in what the Word of God is trying to convey to us. We look at sunshine as representing blessing and good times. Well, it is until you're in drought conditions. Yep. And all of a sudden, you're wishing that sun to go away. You're wishing some clouds would move in and bring with them some rain. Am I telling the truth today? Oh! but we look at rain as being representative of bad time. That's not what the Word of God is telling us. It's not what the Word of God is telling. It's telling us that God causes the sun to shine on the good and the bad. He allows the uh, rain to fall on the good and the bad. Nobody's exempt from the sun. Nobody's exempt from the rain. But you want to know something? Everybody needs both. True. So if you're sitting there saying, well, I wish the sun would always shine. I wish there'd never be any rain clouds. I wish the sky would never darken. I wish I never had to hear the sound of thunder. I wish I never had to witness the sight of lightning. Oh, honey. You don't know what you're wishing for. If you lived in a world that looked like that, you'd be in deep trouble real fast. It wouldn't take two weeks before the water around you would dry up and you would have nothing to drink and your sustenance would be gone and you wouldn't be able to grow anything and you wouldn't be able to have any food. And all of a sudden you'd be realizing you know what? I'm glad God allows the rain to fall on the good and the bad. Hello now. I'm glad God allows the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm glad that God doesn't exempt me from the good or the bad times because the bad times produce something in me that the good times cannot produce. The bad times, the difficult times, the struggles bring something out in me that I would never see had I not had to go through that difficult time. Some people say, oh, I don't understand why I've got to suffer. I don't understand why I've got to go through this. I'm just doing the master's business. Well, I'm going to tell you what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart. As I was preparing this message, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you know what my answer is to those people who say that to me? My answer is, and what makes you so special? Why should you be exempt from all the struggle? Because you're doing the work of God. 
aren't there a hundred other people right behind you who are willing to do exactly the same work you're doing? You're not the only one doing it. There's all kind of people out there doing it. What makes you so necessary to the equation that I can't function, that my church can't function without you being present? Hello now. What are you doing that is so unique that I must rely solely upon you to get it done? Oh my goodness and mercy. Think about it today, church. How many folks in the church are just like everybody else in the church? You don't do nothing. You come to church, you worship, you go home. You don't tithe. You don't support the church. You don't support the pastor. You don't go to church business meetings. You're not on the church board. You don't teach Sunday school. You're not involved in children's church. Uh, you don't do outreach. You don't do nursing home visitation. You don't do nursing home ministry. You don't do prison ministry. You don't do shut-in ministry. No, you're like... 90% of the people in the church, and I got news for you, I've been in church my whole life, and this is how it works. 10% of the people in the church, if you're blessed, are the workers. Those are the people who really work for the Lord and put their effort in, and they do everything they can for the kingdom of God. And then you got 90% that just ride on the waves. But let one of those 90% be told by the doctor they've got cancer and immediately they're, oh, I don't understand. Oh, I don't understand how God could allow this to come upon me. Aren't I a good Christian? Don't I go to church every Sunday? Aren't I faithful? You and a thousand people just like you. What's so unique about you? See, you say, oh, pastor, what you're saying is crazy. No, it's not. No, it's not. Read your Bible. I got news for you. There is a consistent pattern in the Word of God of unique people being subject to God's unique blessing and God's unique provision Oh my Lord, have mercy, am I telling the truth? You get one person out of a thousand who's doing the right thing and God will go to some extraordinary lengths to keep that person well and to provide for them, even in a drought, even in a difficult time. Look at only Elijah. The Word of God said the prophets of Baal were 500 and besides that were the prophets of the groves. All the prophets in the land had gone rogue. We're representing false gods. But Elijah was standing firm and he was standing alone for the God of Israel. And I got news for you, the God of Israel went far out of his way to keep Elijah alive and to keep Elijah healthy and to keep Elijah functioning. Am I telling the truth? Said, hey, you go set up camp by this brook over here. And the word of God said the Lord sent birds to feed him. Am I telling the truth? They brought him food in their beaks. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, when you start doing something in this world and in the kingdom of God that makes you unique and valuable to the kingdom of God. And you might find that God shields you from some things. You think the word of God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you think that's just there for kicks? Do you think maybe God doesn't know what he's talking about? Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you folks, too many people want to think that just because they give God some piddly little effort that they're supposed to walk with nothing but health, they're supposed to walk in nothing but prosperity and blessing. Well, too many Christians, including too many preachers, 
are willing to do what all the other saints and what all the other preachers are doing. I got news for you. 95% of preachers are just doing the same thing every other preacher is doing. How do you think the Trump cult was able to infiltrate the church as quickly and as easily as it did. I'll tell you why. Because there are too many dingbat preachers out there who just go with the flow. If Billy Graham's son Franklin says, I'm supposed to worship at the feet of Donald J. Trump, then hallelujah, I worship the old Donald, old Donald. Why, if Kenneth Copeland says, I'm supposed to glorify the orange god, then I'm going to glorify the orange god, hallelujah, because they're not even trying to operate with any kind of discernment. They're not even trying to operate hearing from the, the Holy Ghost. They're not even trying to operate with any judgment. They're not even trying to operate within the prophetic. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And yet they'll be the first person when trouble comes, they're going to say, Why, Lord? Why me, Lord? I've just been trying to do the right thing, God. I've just been trying to do what you want me to do. And the Holy Ghost said, No, you ain't. No, you ain't been trying to do what I want you to do. You've been trying to go along with the flow. You've been trying to take the path of least resistance. You've been trying to make sure nobody got mad at you and nobody got upset with you because God forbid you take a position that's contrary to the position they're taking. Mm -hmm. I know I preach some things that get a lot of people upset. And I'm sure there's probably a thousand or more people out there in the mainstream church world who scream, cult, 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 cult. I'm sure of it because they scream that every time any preacher preaches anything they don't want to hear. I'm sure of that. But you know what? I'm going to preach what God's told me to preach. I'm going to preach the affirming gospel. I'm going to preach an affirming message because that's what God's called me to preach. And whether the multitudes and whether the majority like it or hate it, I'm going to preach it anyway because I'm not trying to answer to them. I'm trying to answer to God. Amen. That's right. God takes care of those who are unique. God takes care of those who stand out from the crowd, not those who go along with the crowd. In 2 Kings 18, 21 through 22, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. He was in the majority. But God had kept him by the brook. Hallelujah. God made sure he had water. God made sure he had food. Am I telling the truth today? Now, it didn't say he had you know, a uh, uh, four seasons that he was staying in by the brook. He may not have had the most glorious provisions. There are times we've got to go through experiences where our provisions are meager, but we're provided for. The Word of God said, having food and raiment therewith, we ought to be content. Am I telling the truth? See, the problem is we've got too many Christians. They're not content unless they're living a lavish life. They're not content unless everything is just falling on them like, you know, feathers out of the sky filled with diamonds and rubies. Unless everything is so glorious. But you know what? If God meets my needs and I'm provided for, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Only Elijah was speaking the word of the Lord. And all the prophets had gone rogue. Yet the Lord provided for and protected Elijah. Why? So that he could do what the Lord wanted and needed him to do when the time was right. Got news for you today, children. I got the hard truth for you today. Too many Christians are expendable. My Lord, have mercy. 
I told you this wasn't going to be an easy message here, but it's a necessary message. Swallow your spinach. Chew up your broccoli. You may not like it, but you need it. Too many Christians are expendable. Their walk with the Lord is cookie cutter. Like redcoats in the Revolutionary Army of England, when one would fall, another simply steps forward to take his place. A lot of Christians, that's how they're, they, they're, they look like everybody else, act like everybody else, do like everybody else. Honey, what difference does it make if you live or die? If you fall dead right in front of me, there's another one looks just like you, acts just like you, does just like you, right behind you, to take your place. The one that fell in front of you, you just stepped forward and took his place. Am I telling the truth now? Over and over again, the Word of God tells us that the majority will without fail miss the mark, while only a few will actually find it. Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many neither be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Revelation 17, 14. There's, uh, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen. What did we read in Matthew 22, 14? Many are called, but few are chosen. Those that make war with the Lamb, those who are fighting on the Lord's side in the book of Revelation, are called and chosen, but listen, and faithful. Faithful to the least possible extent? No. Faithful to the most possible extent. To the greatest possible extent. And this is why God has chosen them. Got people in our country today practically worship at the altar of football. They go to church at NFL coliseums. They shout and scream, not because Jesus went to the cross for them, but Tommy, they shout and scream because a little pigskin filled with air crosses the white line on one side or the other of a football field. Every team, every game, they choose an individual that they deem their most valuable player. Is that the person who sat on the bench and was never called out onto the field? Yeah, he's the most valuable. Well, I'll tell you what. He sat there with 50 other guys, never went onto the field, never did a thing. But by God, he does it every game. Whoa, he's faithful. There in one game. He's been on the Cowboys for 10 years, had never played a game, but he's faithful. Have you ever seen the most valuable player chosen who didn't give it his all, who didn't perform above and beyond? Hello now. Oh, and when it comes time to pay people, when it comes time to negotiate your contract, guess who's making the most money? Guess who other teams are vying for and trying to recruit and trying to convince that, you know, when you become a free agent, you need to come over our way. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. Who is it, Tommy, that you see experiencing all of this blessing and all of this abundance? It ain't the fool who sits on the bench along with 50 other guys and never does the thing. No, it's that one who without fail, game after game after game is viewed as the most valuable player. Got preachers. 
I don't understand why I've got cancer. I don't understand why I'm sick. I don't understand why I'm having to go through this or that or why I'm having to experience this or that. I'm only doing the Lord's work. No, you're not. You're doing what's comfortable for you. You're, you're only going as far as you're willing to go. I remember there was a time in my life when i had gone into an apostolic church and I came into an understanding of Jesus' name, baptism, and I was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'll be honest, I was only 18 years old at the time. I wasn't ready to make the sacrifices. I wasn't ready to put up with the struggle I was going to have to go through having been born and raised in a Trinitarian Pentecostal church. I wasn't ready to, to, to break away from the church and the people that I'd grown up with and, and start a new journey and a whole new movement. I wasn't ready yet, so what did I do? I went back to the denomination that I was comfortable in. I started my first two churches in that denomination. They were very successful. They did extremely well. Yeah, because I was where I was most comfortable. Was I preaching everything I knew? No, I was not. Am I ashamed to say that now? Yes, I am. When the day finally came that God showed me some things and I finally said okay come hell or high water I'm going to make the switch I'm going to move and I switched and I became part of the one God Jesus name Acts 238 preaching movement I had friends that it, you'd have thought I'd come out as queer. I'll tell you what. I had people Tommy that I've known for decades all of a sudden didn't want nothing to do with me didn't want to know me, didn't want nothing to do with me. Oh, you'd have thought I was preaching Satan was king of the world. I'm glorifying Jesus Christ. I'm lifting Jesus Christ. I'm preaching the divinity of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, they claim to believe in. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I'm not preaching it their way. Oh, isn't it funny how many people get upset? It, they don't matter if you believe the same thing they believe. You got to believe it the exact same way they believe it. You got to describe it. You got to talk it. You got to uh, tell about it the same exact way they do. Because if you don't explain it exactly the way they do, honey, then you're not good enough to be part of their little team. Am I telling the truth? But I had to finally come to a place where I was willing to obey God and I was willing to pay the price. Because I got some hard truth for you today, folks. As you walk with the Lord, there are going to be many, many times, many times, when you're going to have to make some hard decisions. There are going to be many times when you're going to have to leave some folks behind who aren't willing to move forward in their walk with God with you. They're not willing to step into new understanding. How many of us in the LGBT affirming movement, how many of us have friends and family and people we've known for years who are not willing to walk with us into a new understanding of LGBT issues? Hello now. But if you've got the strength of character, have you got the strength in you to go ahead and walk in that new understanding by yourself even if nobody else is willing to walk with you first uh, excuse me second corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 30 i'm trying to hurry are they ministers of christ paul said i speak as a fool i am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by 
mine own countrymen, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Well, gee, there goes the argument. I don't understand why i got to go through this when I'm doing the work of God. Hello now, am I telling the truth? Honey, you ain't anywhere near as important to the church as Paul was. God entrusted him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And yet, look at everything he had to go through. And look... He got news of all this before he ever started. See, I'm here to tell you today, before you ever get started, there are going to be some shipwrecks. There are going to be some people that die around you. There are going to be false brethren. Hello now. There are going to be countrymen. Your own countrymen who put your life at risk. There's going to be a lot of negativity. There's going to be a lot of bad things that come your way. But the Word of God, Paul admonishes us in our primary text today. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Man, we got Christians, the first bad thing comes their way. They're falling out and giving up on God and giving up on their walk with God. My God, have mercy. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Heaven's given to you for free, but the journey toward getting there will not be trouble free it will not be without its difficulties but honey the difference between you and the sinner the difference between you and the unbeliever is you've got somebody walking with you you got somebody who will help you to make it through without fail the believer survives Jesus said, I give you power to tread upon serpents and upon all the power of the devil. And nothing shall by any means harm you. That doesn't mean you ain't going to get hurt, but you ain't going to die. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through trouble, but you're not going to be destroyed. Hallelujah. If I must needs glory, Paul said, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. You see, if I suffer with him, then I'll also reign with him. Hallelujah. The level of reward commiserates with the level of struggle. If God, the Word of God said that God didn't allow any temptation to come upon us that is beyond our ability to bear it. Isn't that what the Word of God says? So if God allows these troubles to come our way, then sweetheart, He's already got a reward in heaven laid up for you in anticipation of your walking with Him, listen to me, children, and making it through. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? God didn't prevent them from going into the fiery furnace. He just went in there with them. <laughs> Hallelujah. And because, oh glory, and because he was in there with them, they made it out. Mm -hmm. Whatever trouble you're in today, whatever struggle you're in today, whatever's happening in your body, whatever's happening in your mind, whatever's happening in your job, whatever's happening in school, whatever's happening in your family, whatever's happening in your marriage, Whatever's happening in your life, you're going to make it through. The old song said, Hold itarava shandovarakobara titayanamahai. The word of God said, Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold. To God's unchanging hand. Oh, honey, the last thing you want to do when the trouble comes is let go of God. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest mistake you'll ever make. You let go of God. The Word of God said you deny Him. Paul said in our primary text, 2 Timothy 2, he said if we deny Him, He'll deny us. Mm -hmm. 
You let go of God's hand and got news for you. You're on your own. That trouble you were so afraid of, it's going to overtake you. That struggle you're so afraid of, it's going to destroy you. That sickness you're so afraid of, it's going to kill you. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Don't let go of that hand. This is the hard truth today. You can make it. You can prevail. You can have victory. You can have healing. You can have deliverance. But in order to achieve that, you've got to stay in the race. You got to keep holding his hand. Lastly, today, 2 Timothy 3 10 through 12. But thou, Paul writes, hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Listen, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Hallelujah. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm trying to close up right now. we got people in the church today in America, especially in America, Love to gripe and grow. Oh, the church is being persecuted. What a bunch of sissies. What a bunch of cotton picking. You talk about limp. Honey, don't you ever call me a limp wristed sissy. There are more limp wristed sissies in the church than there are anywhere in the world. My God, let a breeze blow when they claim they're being persecuted. Let a drop of rain fall and they claim they're being persecuted. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah. You know I'm telling the truth. We got people in America constantly, churches in America, preachers in America, constantly screaming about persecution. But the Word of God said that when persecution comes our way, listen, we ought to rejoice that we have been counted worthy to be persecuted for his name's sake. Persecution ought to be a badge of honor. Not so that we go crying home to mommy because we're being persecuted, bless God. I got some hard truth for you today, folks. Christian living isn't always easy. But it's always blessed. You say, well, how can it always be blessed and yet not always be easy? Well, honey, it's blessed if you survive things that have killed everybody else. Mm -hmm. Hello now. In 2000, when I went into the hospital with double pneumonia, my lungs so full, the doctor literally told me, he said, I don't even know how you're able to talk to me right now. He said, your lungs are so full of liquid that I don't even have a clue how you're able to talk to me right now. Within an hour or so of him saying that to me, I was unconscious. Before too long, they had me on life support that day, but I don't know how long because I was unconscious. I spent a month on life support. I spent two months in the hospital. The doctors told my family for a month for a month, every day my mother said, day after day after day for a month, the doctors kept telling my family, he'll be gone within 24 hours. He'll be gone within 24 hours. He'll be gone within 24 hours. Imagine hearing that every day for a month. My mom said every time the phone rang, she was terrified they were calling to say that I'd finally given up the ghost and passed no, God had other plans. Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Do you want to come home or do you want to stay? Never forget it. As long as I live, I've never had an experience like this in my life. I said, Lord, I'm so tired. It, I'm so tired. I can't even explain to you how weak my body was. I started out in a muscular 260 pounds 
Yes, believe it or not, I was fairly muscular back then. I used to work out regularly. I mean, every day I went to the gym. And I worked out, and I, I was looking good. I went down to 135 pounds on that hospital bed. I was so tired. Everything took effort. The machine was breathing for me. I couldn't breathe on my own. They tried to take the intubation out after about a week or so or two, and I began to drown. I literally began to drown, and they had to immediately re-intubate me, which they told me later was something that they dread doing, that, that, that they, they say, from what the doctors told me, literally, they said, re-intubating somebody is one of the worst things we can do. It, it can damage so many things that, you know, well, they had to because I literally was drowning. Holy Ghost said, you want to come home or do you want to stay? And I was so tired and I, I just didn't have any fight left in me. I said, Lord, I'm ready. I said, I want to go home. I want to go home. And immediately... I begin to feel. Don't ever tell me that the soul ain't real. Don't, don't tell me the spirit isn't real in man. Because honey, you're talking to the wrong guy. I begin to feel my spirit separating from my body. And as it began to separate, this the most incredible sensation came over me that I've ever experienced in my life. I can't explain it. There was the peace there was a separation from anxiety. There was no fear. There was no... I wasn't anxious. I wasn't worried about nothing. You know, they talk about being high, you know, and how you when you're high, ooh, you're just separated from all the... Well, I, that was the biggest high I'd ever been on in my life. And then all of a sudden, a thought come into my head about the little affirming church that I was trying to work on in Connecticut where I was at. And there wasn't but a handful of men that came to our little church. And all of a sudden I said, wait, Lord, I can't go. I said, there's nobody in the wings ready to do the work that I'm doing. Remember what I said about doing something unique? And immediately... I literally felt like my spirit, I mean, it dropped, it fell like a ton of bricks back into my body. And all of a sudden, I, I mean, it hit, I, I can't describe it, it hit with a, <laughs> it's like when your spirit and your body rejoin, you know, there's a, it, it's almost with violence. It, you know how when you, you put something together, I, I hate to use this analogy, but the clip in a gun. You know, when you put a clip in a gun, for that clip to be in there the way it's meant to be in there, you kind of got to give it a good hit, and it'll click. Well, that's what the spirit and the soul and the body, that's what it's like when the two of them come back together. You know, you kind of get that click sensation. A little while later, I went through the same exact experience a second time. And God said to me a second time, do you want to come home or do you want to stay? And I said, Lord, I'm so tired, I want to go. And as I began to feel that separation, and I felt so good, and I felt so great, and all of a sudden I was reminded of that little church that I was supposed to be pastoring. And how much those men relied on me, and how much there aren't very many people preaching the message I'm preaching. There aren't many pastors, there aren't very many workers in the field that I'm trying to labor in. And as that memory, that thought came to me, I said, Lord, I can't go. I've got to stay. And again, I felt that peace. And then the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me just clear as a bell and said to me, you'd better make up your mind because the next time I ask you, there'll be no going back. All of a sudden, Tommy, it dawned on me. All of a sudden, I realized God was putting this decision in my hands. People say, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Nope. Wrong. Wrong. 
God put the decision whether I lived or died in my hands. He said, it's up to you. Make up your mind. And I began to think. And I said, well, Lord, the reason I keep coming back is because I'm trying to do a work in the LGBT community. I'm trying to help people rediscover your grace. I'm trying to help backsliders come back to God. I'm trying to help people who have been alienated and pushed away from the church trying to help them find you and you know and I begin to reason everything out and all of a sudden it dawned on me wait a minute I can't go anywhere I can't go anywhere I'm needed here I'm needed here now you may be watching us today and you're thinking to yourself well I sure don't need you well that's all well and good but somebody out there needed me and I knew it I knew if there had been another minister, Tommy, who could have slipped in and taken over what I was doing, I'd have left in a minute. I'd have gone on to glory without a thought. But I knew there wasn't. If there was another preacher that I knew was going to step in and fill my shoes and preach the affirming apostolic message, then I would have gone home and not even thought about it twice. But I knew that wasn't the case. And I finally, I, I was intubated. I had, you know, all the, the oxygen through the my throat and all that. I couldn't speak, but in my mind, I said, okay, Lord, I've, I've, I've made a decision. I said, I can't go anywhere. I said, I don't know how in the world you're going to do it. I literally could only picture myself living the rest of my days in a wheelchair or something. I thought for sure I was going to. But I said, but if that be the case, I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing anyway. Whatever i got to do, I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, You shall not die, <laughs> but you shall live. My mother came to see me and they had given me a little pad of paper and crayons. Because, you know, when you're intubated, you... You see visions and, and you have hallucinations and stuff. And so they can't give you a pencil or a pen or anything you can stab yourself with, you know. And they had untied my hands because when they first intubated me, they had my hands tied to the bed so I wouldn't try to pull out the tubes and stuff. But they asked me, can we trust you not to pull anything out if we undo your hands? I said, yeah. Or shook my head, yes, when I was conscious enough. And I wrote on that paper, I said, I'm going to live. My mother read it. She looked at me and she says, how do you know? And I wrote on that paper, God told me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, did I have to go through one of the most harrowing, horrific, difficult struggles of my life? In 2000, absolutely I did. If I had to do it again, would I want to do Never in this world. I kid you not, if, if I ever had to go through that kind of an experience again, I don't know how I'd react. Because it was horrible, folks. I, I could carry on and on and tell you about the hallucinations I had and, and the things that I was experiencing. It was terrible. The, the weakness, the, the exhaustion. Every minute of every day I felt like I had just got through wrestling an army of bears. Every minute that I, breathing was painful and it was a struggle. Lifted my hand to carry a crayon so I could write on paper. I kid you not, I kid you not. Lifting my hand to do that, I felt like I was lifting a hundred pounds. I'll never forget, even when I come out of the hospital, I went through that for months. My, I was so weak that everything I did felt like I was just weighted down, you know, by thousands of pounds. Did I have to go through all that? Yes, I did. Was I doing the work of God? Yes, I was. Did that experience give me a testimony to the power of God? 
and the power of faith and trust in God and the power of prayer. Oh, yes, it did. But the greatest testimonies come from the greatest struggle. You don't get a powerful testimony without going through an awful powerful experience. Am I telling the truth? Did I have to go through it? Yes, I did. But the key to that phrase is, I got through it. <laughs> I got through it. I got news for you today, child of God. You're going to get through it too. You're not exempt from struggle. You're not exempt from sickness. You're not exempt from trials, hardships, or pain. That's the hard truth. But the good news is, you will get through it. Hallelujah. Paul said, But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And that today is the hard truth. Would you bow your heads with me this afternoon?